All right. Um, Christian uh, said one thing that is really going to be crucial to my talk, and that is I, I'm, I don't study games uh, because I think games are the solution to our educational problems. I study games because I think the sort of learning that they embed is the solution to our educational problems. And that learning can be delivered in lots of different ways. Now, it's probably more important today than ever that we get learning right. Uh, you know that in our society, inequality has increased dramatically. Uh, there is a study that just came out, a group of papers called Wither Opportunities, sponsored by the Spencer Foundation and some other foundations, that has shown now for the first time uh, the gap of kids in school by class has passed the gap in race. I mean, the inequality has gotten so big now that the gap between rich and poor is even bigger than the gap between uh, white and black, and that there has been more progress in the gap between white and black than there has between then poor and rich. So we are facing worse inequality than we have ever faced. Um, and uh, with schools, as you know, that are accountability regimes and uh, test prep academies. So it's important that we see that games are only one thing and an arsenal to create what I'm going to call situated learning. Now, just because I, I, I want to concentrate on the learning, not the games, I do want to make clear, for, for how many people here are gamers? OK, so a lot of you know this already. It's, it's really important to see that there's, there are all different types of games. That there is more than Grand Theft Auto, which is what you'd think only. Uh, and that a game is defined by a set of problems and some good tools to solve the problems. So, here is Chibi Robo. The problem here is how do you clean a house when you're a four-inch robot? Who, by the way, can only stay out a little time because he's got to plug that cord in when he's running out of electricity. In addition, he also has to make uh, the, the people in the family whose house he's cleaning happy. Here is happiness points. Uh, he's got a very dysfunctional family, so he's got to get that going. And he has some other uh, problems. So that's not Grand Theft Auto. By the way, it's a fabulous game, brilliantly designed. Uh, don't tell me that you can't get teenagers to learn algebra if this can, people can get them to be a four-inch house cleaning robot. That, that motivates people to do something you probably, on the face of it, wouldn't think you want to do. Um, the Sims, the best-selling game in history, is a simulation of a family, a community. You build houses, you build families, you solve problems. In this, some players give each other challenges, and one challenge that... Uh, is a good example is a woman gave a challenge to sim players to play the game and act out the life of a poor single parent and manage to get your kids to college or at least successfully out of the house, something that's very difficult to do in this game because it's not fun being poor. So it becomes very challenging. Portal, very popular game. The problems here are physics. It's in-body, tacit physics, as you figure out how the physics of this world works so that you can get out of a laboratory where a mad robot wants to kill you. Um, game that is uh, made uh, by scientists for everyday people to play to help them do science. They're probably going to regret this, by the way, because the everyday people are beating them. Uh, it's called Fold It. You fold proteins, uh, see if you can find the optimal fold for protein, which is something that a supercomputer finds extremely difficult to do. And players of this game have published twice in science um, and recently discovered uh, a pro the right fold for protein that helps cause AIDS. Uh, that had befuddled scientists for decades. You see my problem once the scientists let this crowdsource these problems, we don't really need them anymore. Um, <laughs> all right, so, uh, so that's just to give you the feel that there are, uh, uh, there are lots of video games and they're defined by problems. But uh, what is interesting about the video game industry uh, is that since you're selling problem solving, you have to actually get people to be able to solve the problems, right? There's no, uh, there's no way that you can dumb it down. There's no way that you can, if the person can't learn to do it, they return the game, right? You go broke if you're not a good teacher. That's it. And it's not an accountability regime set up in Washington. Now, I want to back way up, though, because I think sometimes, especially among educators, we miss that there are primordial truths we know about uh, learning and about educating people that have not changed and are not going to change in the digital age. Uh, so let me just discuss three of those. These are three conditions that we've known for decades apply to learning. And if you don't get them right, you will not get good learning and you will produce equity gaps. And they have nothing to do with digital media. One thing is the biggest predictor before a kid goes to school of success in school, for all of schooling, success in first grade, middle school, high school, and college, the biggest predictor 
uh, before the age of five is how much language the child has heard from an adult. There is nothing more effective for learning than a kid interacting over time with an adult in language. That is not playing 20 questions, not having directions given, but getting into a real conversation with an adult. That's the biggest correlate. It's also why the other biggest correlate, which I think is just a substitute for it, is the child's oral vocabulary at the age of five correlates with the success of school thereafter, right? So uh, yes, digital world, but uh, there better be talk. There better be interaction. And the, the, we're going to talk about interactivity, but there is no more important interactivity than an adult talking to a child. The other thing we know about learning for de decades, by the way, some very spiffy experiments in psychology showed this. Humans, if given problems that are abstract and where nothing is at stake for them, they don't see anything that's going to come out of it in their benefit or for their interest, cannot learn well. But when you do put a, something at stake, when there's something there that the person cares about, all of a sudden the person gets really smart. So there's these things called the Wasson experiments where you give people these kind of logic problems. And if the problem is just sort of abstract shapes, 75% of the people get them wrong. But if you give the very same logical problem on you know, a, a rule about who can go to what school and you want to catch the people cheating trying to get the, into the better school even though they don't live in the district, uh, then 75% uh, get it right. It's the same rule. But when they care about it, when something's at stake, when it's embedded in some sort of narrative, people are very, very smart. It's, it always reminds me, you know, when Piaget said little children can't conserve, that is, they can't tell a big glass and a small glass full of the same water, or if you put beads out in a long string and a short, 10 beads in a long string, 10 in a short, they think the long one's got more beads, they can't conserve. Uh, then somebody tried not beads but M&Ms and found out they can conserve perfectly well. <laughs> Um, and then the final third thing is what I call situated meanings, and that is that we know that when you hand people words, books, texts, that if you just give them the books and the texts, uh, they will not learn well from them, that you have to also give them images, actions, and experiences that are related to the book. That is, they have to be in a world the book is about. They have to have had experience, right? Now, you can already see that that is going to be a, a core feature of games. All right, now I want to go through some principles about how games teach. And there's a lot of them, and I'm not going to pick the one, I'm not going to do them all. I'm going to do the ones that are most relevant to educators in that if you're, if you're running a museum, because you're an educator, or you're running a community center or a school, and these principles are not in your learning, or if you're making games and these principles are not in your games, then you are not going to speak to the equity gap. Okay. Now, the first thing is we've known for decades that if you focus on facts and information in school, you can teach in such a way you'll get the test passed. But it will never correlate with problem solving. Kids who have A's in physics, who have just been taught a bunch of facts and formulas, cannot use their physics to solve any problem at all. And six years out of school, they can't even remember the facts. Okay? So a fact-based information a museum or education is worthless except for getting into Harvard or something, which is probably good for you. All right, when you focus on problem solving done right, which means that you teach the facts, the information, the formulas as tools to solve the problem, then you get problem solving and fact retention, both. Why? Because you care about the fact now because you see how it works. So when David Schaefer has kids playing a game where they redesign Madison in Wisconsin, there's hundreds of codes you have to use to do rezoning and stuff. Schools would say, okay, after you memorize these 300 codes, then you can play the game, right? That's, that's a game company on the way out of business, right? What he does is he says, you're going to play the game. You're going re, to redesign Madison. You're going to answer the critics and the mayor and everybody else. Uh, but, you know, no way to do it unless you put the right code in. So kids think about the design, use the code so often that at the end they know them all, but they don't know how they know them. You get the facts free. See, we get free when in school we have to pay billions of dollars to get a bunch of facts to pass tests. So uh, problem you have to have problem-focused stuff. Now, human beings want problem-focused learning to be interactive, but what does interactive really mean? A, a lot of people tell me, something. this is interactive because, you know, the kid can, he can walk around it. Chris Crawford has argued interactivity is, is a good conversation. 
That is, you do something and the thing does something back that is both a genuine reply to what you did and an invitation about what you can do next. So it's not interactive just because you're doing stuff. In a game like Chibi Robo, when, whenever you try something in here, the game will say back to you uh, the feedback you need to know what's a good next move. Right? Good, good interactivity is a conversation that has got feedback and suggests a path of action. So it feels like you're talking to a person in a sense. The game, and, and that's the interactivity that's in games. That's the, um, now, I said that uh, games are problem-based learning. But, and a lot of people talk about problem-based learning or project-based learning. And uh, they miss one very important thing, especially if you're a liberal. Because if you're a liberal, problem-based learning is just turn the kids loose. Just let them do anything they want to do, right? Um, the fact is we know, again, from tons of research that with human beings, when you're going to do problem-based learning, the problems must be well-ordered. They must be well-ordered. Why? It turns out humans are so creative that if you give them an early problem that is hard and demanding, they come up with a beautifully creative answer that never works again. But if you start with the right problems that give generative solutions, the solution works again and again and can be built on, right? So, and all game designers know this, right? That's why there's levels in games. So anything goes, turn people loose, no. Uh, you have to order the problems. Now here's, here's a big issue about, the problem that is gonna be best for you to start depends on where you already are, right? So if you're out there in the museum and you're gonna learn about color, it, there is a problem. Where does the guy start? He needs to know what's the first problem to give me because I have a very different background than you. And before, we couldn't customize this. But with digital media, with games, with artificial intelligence, they can order the problems based on what your background and experience is. They can customize to you, right? Too often today, we're using customization to make things easy. I don't want to do that. I want to use customization though to know where should the conversation start with you. And that's something we haven't been able to do. You know in school, we, you know, we try to have 30 kids and start the conversation, give the problem based on where the average kid is. And by the way, there's a lot of diversity in the classroom, but nobody is the average kid. So that is one of, one of the things you certainly want to do. And, and, and when you get real interactivity, it has to have that customization. Um, now, one of the things is we are all, you know, our schools and even many of our museums are shrines to information, right? Think about, for example, how many museums and how many schools have taught how the seasons work. And they, we cannot find a single American who knows the answer to that question. Uh, we know they've all been taught it, we have it. Um, you know, every year at Harvard at graduation, some guy asks the Harvard graduates how does the seasons work, and 75% of them have no idea. So you get the idea that simply giving people information, like in an exhibit, here's how the seasons work in a school, it doesn't work. How many, most of you don't know how the seasons work. Right? No, it's not how close the sun is. <clears throat> so same thing with, you know, I was in an exhibit today where they were talking about color and learn for the 400th time how color works, and I won't remember it past tonight's drink, I guarantee you, right? So, why is this? Not, it's partly the customization problem, but the real problem is this. Humans don't lear learn when you just give them a bunch of words. You have to give language or information in what I call just in time or on demand. Just in time means just give me a little piece of it and let me see how it works right now. Just, sh sh okay, you want me to understand red and green? Let's stick to red and green. Let me see it happen, right? And tell me right now, because if I don't understand it, I can ask you again. Don't go on to purple yet, you know? So, um, so uh, just in time means give language when it is needed and when it can be used and when the person sees what it means by an experience, by a goal, by an image, not by more words. Now, language of demand is different. When I'm up to speed and I say to you, I want an encyclopedia, have the encyclopedia ready. See, so the game Civilization, it gives you tons of words just in time, little bits that you can just understand that apply. Pretty soon you say, God, I'd love to know a lot more about Egypt, and all of a sudden, an encyclopedia drops into your hands, right? There is one in the game. Schools would give it to you first, 
But you see, on demand means I'm ready for it now. I want a lecture. I want an assignment. And kids will, lo and behold, they will ask, right? They, in fact, in age of mythology, they become total experts in mythology and write their own encyclopedias, right? So language just in time and on demand. It, whether, you know, art museums are just a big offender here. You know how our art museums, you've got the painting. You've got to stand back here to watch it, but it's got the little description up here. So you, it's great for uh, obesity, right? You can lose a lot of weight walking back and forth, right? But, and in fact, you don't, and, and, and the thing there, it doesn't give you anything about how to look at the painting. It tells you when the guy was born, right? So um, that's not interactivity. All right, now, the biggest, you know, people have argued, again, this is an equity gap thing, uh, that uh, pe the biggest property for learners is a thing that's been called grit. What is grit? Grit is persistence, past failure married to passion. Now, why would you have to have passion? Because we know for human beings, learning is a practice effect. You have to learn anything at a mastery level, whether it's algebra, game design, Yu-Gi-Oh, you have to have spent hundreds or thousands of hours doing it, and you're not going to do that if you don't have passion. You're not going to persist past failure. So you have to teach a kid how to persist past failure. Now, games are very good at this because they're a form of failure-based learning. You know, there's a lot of studies that show Americans, this is not true of a lot of Asians, Americans think that if you fail at something, it means you're no good at it, so they just give up. Asians think if you fail at something, you ought to work harder. Right? And they don't give up. And the attitude that if you fail, you're not good at it is just disastrous. Right? And you, for example, every game, sooner or later, you're going to fail. And they have to create an image that says failure is good. It's not bad. It's a form of learning. And might as well get it done quickly. You can map, if, you know, if you're in a maze and you bump your head, at least you're mapping the maze. Right? So uh, uh, failure-based learning is crucial to games. And yet look what school has done with failure. It has made failure a sign of losers, people are no good, who have to be special. Um, all right, so pers persistence past failure. Now, I want to stress, though, this idea, because this, again, is very important to the equity divide. Um, people don't learn stuff if they don't choose it. They don't learn it if they don't have an interest in it, right? So we all know one of the goals of any teacher is to get you, to, when you're teaching algebra, to answer the question that's in the kid's head. Why in the hell should I learn this? Right? And if you haven't answered that question, nothing's going to happen. Right? But the crucial 21st century question in a world where three-fifths, in a country like ours, where three-fifths of the jobs are service work and the biggest employer is Walmart, is only kids who have passion for something that drives thousands of hours of practice in something are going to get out of Walmart. And one of the things we need to know, and it should be a job of museums, a job of community centers, a job of families, is letting kids find their passion. And that means, of course, we can't make every kid do the same thing. We need hundreds of interest-driven groups and affiliations so that kids can sample and eventually find where their passion is and then be driven. Uh, because without that, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether you get your degree. You know, by the way, the people at Walmart have degrees. Right? Now, the other thing that is crucial to games and crucial to learning is what I, can, what I will call the cycle of expertise or the challenge cycle. This is very typical of human learning, and research has shown that real experts, whether they have credentials or not, real experts actually make themselves undergo this cycle. And the cycle is this. You take something you're not very good at. It's challenging. It has to be doable. You have to know it's doable. Otherwise, the stress level is so high, you go to the hospital. And then you do it and you practice it for hours, right? Until you, this, is what, this is just how level design is. You start a game, it's really hard. Then through the level, you've done this a billion times. Now you're really good at it. Boy, you feel so powerful. You could just, you know, it's wonderful. Now you have taken something that was challenging and made it routine. Now it's just part of your habit. Now is the time to undo that. That's why there's a boss battle. Because once you have made a skill routine, it's on automatic pilot. Now you need to face a challenge that says to you, it doesn't work anymore. You've got to learn something new. Now, and, and, and you have to now open up that routine mastery and think again. Then practice this new challenge until it's routine. Then challenge the routine again, and you ratchet up the thing. Each level, and, you know, that's why a boss battle is there and say, hey, 
Go back and play more. You haven't, you, you, you got it on routine mastery, but you can't open it up. You can't go to the next level. So challenge, routine, challenge. Now, the expert, uh, literature on real experts is when they get to routine mastery, they seek out a challenge they can't do. They look for that next one that will make them undo the routine uh, mastery. Uh, you know, one of the problems in our schools is the good kids, the, the guns with the good grades on their way to Harvard, have got routine mastery of school-based skills but are rarely faced with any challenge. That's why there's no actual correlation with them, their degrees and how well they'll do in their employment. All right. Uh, so we've often said, oh, you know, our, for poor kids we need to do X, Y, and Z. Well, you know, for rich kids what we need to do is challenge their mastery so they actually learn something other than the application for a college. All right. Um, now, one of the things that is very uh, crucial is to see that when you're talking about games, you are not talking about just the piece of software, right? This is one of the biggest mistakes non-gamers make. Uh, the Portal does teach you some physics, right? But only tacit physics. You don't know how to articulate the physics. For example, if you don't catch on in your body to the law of conservation of momentum, you can't play the game because you've got to figure out how to conserve momentum going in one portal, come out the other to get across rooms and do stuff. And pretty soon, you're really good at it. You know exactly where you should go, what angle, but you couldn't articulate it. So people will often say, well, you know, the games are not really good for learning. Sure, you get a lot of tacit understandings of some physics principles here, but if you can't say it, how could we you know, say that you know physics? Well, that's missing half the action because with almost all good games, there is connected to them a bunch of interest-driven sites, so what I've called affinity spaces. That is, the person's got a real passion for Portal, and they want to go in there with other people and study it, strategize it, mod it, redesign it, argue over it. And in this case, here they are making a wiki. Here they're articulating the physics completely, right? And in fact, when you mod it, if you get the modding tools, which are now available, uh, and you build aspects of Portal or another Portal-like game, you bet you understand the physics because you have to actually do it at a meta level, right? So games are always a game, a curriculum. This, by the way, is true of not any, any curriculum. It's always what you do, the game, married in the modern world to an affinity space where you collaborate with other people and with good tools to actually produce and not just consume to participate and not just spectate, to build, modify, strategize, and to talk, right? To interact. And you have to build both a good community like this, a good affinity space, and you have to build a good game. So, and you know, if you take um, uh, Foldit, the people who do Foldit, I wonder if I brought this, um, uh, they actually get on an affinity space and begin to discuss protein chemistry as well as how the game can be improved. So they're talking like game designers and chemists, but they have no degrees. But they're also, their name is on the article in Science, right? This is the age of pro-ams. This is the age in which nobody can set a limit on anybody. Uh, and credentials don't matter if you can get into the right space. Now, the trouble here is that we've known with books for a long time, that just having books and just reading does not make your kids successful, right? All these people say, oh, just give them a bunch of books, they'll succeed. Not true. It depends what you do with the books. If the books early on are used with interactions with adults where the kid is hearing a lot of adult talk about not the here and now, and the books are linked to the world and to other books, then it is very effective for education. For example, in fundamentalist homes where the reading practice is for the kid to sit silent and not interrupt the parent, but that reading practice does not work for school, right? It's got to be interactive, and it's got to be linked to the world. Well, this, so there's a, what I'd say, there's a value-added set of practices around literacy that actually correlate with school success, and there's ones that not. And that's obliterated if you think the equity gap is just who has the books. It's who has the mentoring and who has the practices. Same is true of digital media. The kids who are driven from the game to the interest-driven space, to the passion and affinity space, who are gaining a passion and then taking it on to strategies or theory crafting and stuff, are getting the higher end of this literacy. And just watching who plays games is gonna, it's just like watching who has a book, right? And again, it's in the mentoring, it's in the practice, it's in the community. So the digital divide here is how do we get more kids 
into these affinity spaces where they're doing the higher order stuff of producing and not just consuming. Uh, and it doesn't happen by chance. It requires a mentor. Now, if you look at a, what I've called affinity spaces, let's say people playing The Sims are designing clothes for The Sims. We have to use 3D tools. Uh, they're together, they're designing the stuff, they're uploading it, people are taking it all over the world. Uh, there's a woman I talk, I have, a, I have a new, relatively new book that I wrote with my wife on women as gamers. 70 year old woman there, shut in, begins to design for The Sims. She now has 13 million customers taking her stuff. She's a superstar in design, right? All started because her six year old granddaughter said, Mommy, uh, there's no purple potties in the stores in The Sims. Could you make me a purple potty? And all of a sudden, she got hooked on the affinity space and design, is a champion designer, world designer. Still can't leave her house, doesn't matter. Uh, now, when you look at the best of these affinity spaces, that is, see, this is a space connected to the Sims. You pick up skills in the Sims, you think about them at a meta level in design, then you put them back on the Sims. You become a designer, a collaborator, a system thinker, as well as, by the way, if she sold the stuff, she gives it away free, she'd be a millionaire. She could sell it a buck a piece, then she'd have $13 million. By the way, one thing that really in that story angered me as an old academic, she has a little thank you book, and she's gotten one million people thanking her. I, 35 years I've been an academic, I'm in 14. I mean, so I'm doing this wrong. Now, the interesting thing about these affinity spaces is they're not age graded. They have 12 year olds to 70 year olds, and time does not play any role. The biggest variable screwing learners is time. Carnegie units. Pretending people start at the same place, so if they don't finish at the same time, one is dumber than the other. That is the way, you, th th there is no feature that is more advantages the rich than we put a clock on the learning because they've already done half of it at home. Right, these spaces are never timed. Nobody gives a damn whether you became a champion designer in six weeks, six months, or six years, they just want the designs. Right? And you start where you start. You'll always find somebody in the space who can help you. And by the way, sometimes 12-year-olds teach and mentor because they know more about it. Sometimes a 70-year-old does. Nobody says age makes you a mentor. What makes you a mentor is the allegiance to the standards of that uh, community. Now let me finish with this because I think this is uh, crucial. In, in, uh, in, in this affinity space I was just telling you that has this woman, uh, and not all affinity spaces work this way. Some are tough love, right? If you're a newbie, you got to go through a hazing, right? But this one was not. This one, people behaved. Uh, and they really, they produced very higher order things. And, and by the way, all, this is a game in which once their stuff goes in the game, the game designers don't need to make it anymore and they make the money, right? This is brilliant. Um, on one of the tough love sites, uh, some guy who had actually asked this woman whose name was, her screen name, Tabby Lou, had asked for her advice on several occasions, said, you know, over there on that site, she's considered a real expert. She's, they, they adulate her. I don't think she's a real expert. So I decided to ask her. I went and, you know, over the internet, and I said, Tabby Lou, are you an expert, a technical expert in design? She said, no. Uh, the expertise is in the community. I'm an expert in how to leverage it and how to go back to that community to do what I have to do. The, the knowledge, the expertise, and it's in that community that, that I live in and that I know how to mentor in and be mentored in. Uh, it's not in me. See, now think what would have happened to our economy had Alan Greenspan known that. The guy who ran the economy for 40 years and went to Congress after he collapsed it and said, God, I never saw it coming. Nothing I learned in 40 years of economics ever taught me this would happen. See, the age of the individual expert with the knowledge all in your head, Alan Greenspan was the last one. He's old. This woman, Tabby Lou, is old too, but she's the expert for the next century. Okay, thank you.